neuroscience as a foundation for artificial intelligence. I'm Tanya Hall for ZDNet and Tech Republic, and joining me is Dr. Amir Khosrowshahi, Vice President and Chief Technology Officer of AI Products at Intel. Welcome, Amir. Hi, Tanya. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Give us a, a brief summary of your professional resume. So uh, chronologically, um, I was uh, I studied physics in uh, school, and from there I moved on to work on Wall Street uh, as a trader at Goldman Sachs for a while. Um, that was quite fun, and from there I took six years off to uh, do mountaineering and skiing and surfing, which is not a potentially not a good career choice, but things worked out. I returned to uh, my a passion, which is neuroscience, and I did a PhD in neuroscience at Berkeley. And from there, I got interested in hardware as well as brains and computing and um, went off to uh, uh, some, some other efforts, but then started my own company with two very smart neuroscience co-founders to build processors for artificial intelligence. And interest uh, came from Intel in our company and they acquired it. And they used this uh, company to be the seed organization for an AI group at Intel that they've quite invested quite heavily in and grown to a large size. And that's now I'm currently the CTO of that group. So how has neuroscience informed the research and design of modern machine learning and artificial intelligence technology? It has informed quite a, uh, a bit. It's, and, and it's at different scales at the level of silicon all the way up to applications. And this is not just recent, but the field of AI, neuroscience and computing have been intertwined since the 1930s. So there's a, there's a very rich history to this domain and there's been uh, ebbs and flows of interest in AI itself. I don't know if you're aware of that, but the field started in the 1930s with Alan Turing and John von Neumann and others. So the, these were the uh, individuals who built the theoretical foundations for computer science, uh, artificial intelligence, how to build computers. John von Neumann built the first computer. He was also a physicist, game theorist, uh, polymath. And, um, and at the end of their careers, they also started looking at brains. How do, how, do, how do brains work? What are neurons? How does information get represented in the brain? And how does it, the signals get propagated and so forth and so on? So that was in the, in the 1930s, 1940s. And many of the questions they were asking, uh, they're, they're grand challenges and we're still trying to address them today. So uh, we're still trying to understand how the brain can perform all its computations with just 25 watts. Uh, it's quite remarkable, all the things that you can do. And some of the things that you do are quite complex. You take for granted, like driving. Uh, and then there is the actual material of the brain and the material of silicon. There's parallels there, as well as uh, your behavior and how you navigate the world, drive your car. That also informs how we build autonomous vehicles. So there's parallels at all these different levels. And there's a whole history of it as well. What are the frameworks for brain modeling that neuroscientists use today? And how do those compare to the decision-making structures contained within computer hardware and algorithms? Do, does one mimic the other, or do the approaches necessarily diverge? It's a great question. Uh, so much of what, what is known about the brain uh, is, has been painstaking work over the past 120 years. And we're still scratching the surface. My area of research was the visual system. The eye itself is very complex, surprisingly complex. And the back of the head, the primary visual cortex, where information from the eye goes to the back of the head. So um, just looking at the visual system itself, uh, you observe sensory input. It goes and gets processed and represented differently in your head. And then it goes to other areas, your planning region, so I can reach out and grab a glass of water and or drive a car and um, all, all of these computations are done in some some way so um, and we have some glimpses in how that works that system that ai system that enables me to perform vision and actions can carry over to a system that is potentially um, applicable in the real world like a camera that uh, a security camera or a camera on a robot it has to perform the same things it has to have sensory input, it has to represent the sensory input in some way, and then it has to act on those inputs. So at a high level, we are, um, again, at all levels, we are mapping what we know about how information is represented in neurons and circuits and brain areas and sensory organs 
in the brain to cameras and circuitry and compute and storage and so forth in um, AI systems that we're building. I can go into more detail. Uh, it's <laughs> a pretty rich area. It is, and it's very fascinating. In fact, so, so here's, here's my question then. For the foreseeable future, will AI always need a fast connection to the cloud, or will our edge devices acquire the speed and power needed to, to operate independently? The current limitations of edge devices today, like your cell phones, um, these devices, they're very power limited. And the, the companies and software companies and hardware companies that build uh, applications for these phones are always cognizant of the, this power limitation. And that also carries over to AI to turn on a camera to record and to perform a computation, like recognize your face or recognize gestures, or potentially do more complex things, like so help you navigate if you're blind. That takes, uh, currently takes too much power. So um, there are many uh, directions in the technology space where uh, we can have more edge computing on a phone or whatever device that potentially could be unrelated to AI. It could be bad, better batteries, uh, lower power processors, and better software, better algorithms. Um, but um, I do see in the future that more applications will be running at the edge, AI applications at the edge as we improve in all, in all these directions. So we'll have better algorithms that are, require less compute. Currently our algorithms are very compute intensive. Um, however, today we do have to do this thing where we do a portion of the computation on an edge device and a portion of it in the cloud. And much of the compute and power requirements uh, um, for, these uh, for these computations, because of the cloud, has a lot of power, infinite power, essentially. They're, they're done there. And then there's, you have to manage the latency. I speak into my phone, and then I, I don't want to wait too long before it says something, for example. Intel is, is breaking new ground with its uh, Meso technology. What is Meso, and why will it be such a game changer for AI? Oh, okay, so that's a pretty nerdy uh, question. So Meso is, uh, stands for Magnetoelectric Spin Orbital. Um, it's, and it's actually not as complicated and futuristic as it sounds. Those, all those elements are, if you decouple them, but I, I don't think we have too much time to discuss, but one of the things that I'm very excited uh, about uh, working at Intel is that it makes AI systems all the way from the single atoms all the way up to working with its partners like Google, Facebook, and so forth. So I get to observe this whole um, span of technology and applications and services and business side of things. So MESO is at the very bottom of the stack. It's a very fundamental unit of computation. And for the past uh, 30 or so years, that's potentially more, since the 1970s, we've had a technology called CMOS, complementary metal oxide semiconductor. This technology has really been the driver for uh, the explosive growth of computing. It's a substrate that we build transistors on. And this technology has been around for a while and it's now hitting some limits. It still has quite a ways to go. And at Intel, we're looking for technologies to replace it. So MESO is one candidate that uh, is, is a different kind of material. It's based on room temperature quantum materials um, that can be this replacement transistor. It's non-volatile, has lower switching um, um, energy cost, as well as other uh, features that are very attractive. and um, potentially will be the future of our of computers. Things like MESO, I believe, will be uh, what revolutionizes, revo revolutionizes computing um, and, uh, and AI, potentially. Um, it will be basically the next step after CMOS and uh, current technologies. There's a very bright future to computing. It's not just MESO, but there's lots of cool things that are MESO sounding that you should be looking forward to. We certainly are. Dr. Amir Khosrowshahi, Vice President and Chief Technology Officer of AI Products at Intel. Thanks for shedding some light on this and uh, getting us excited about the future of computing. If somebody wants to connect with you, maybe they want to find out more about that work you're doing, how can they do that? Well, we have a webpage, ai.intel.com, and we have a web presence, and you can reach out. There's many avenues to reach out through there. Or you can just contact me directly on uh, on Twitter. There you go. And you guys can find more of my interviews right here on ZDNet or Tech Republic or go to my website, tanyahall.net. I've got links to all my social sites. Thanks for watching.